Hans Hess, thank you for joining me today. We're going to have a great time in the Word of God today. I want you to open your heart, open your mind to the Word, and let the Spirit of the Lord speak to you today. You know, I've been so blessed to come to you by television for the past few years and really reach the four corners of the globe through TV and through internet, through Zoom crusades we've been doing. It's just, it's just amazing what God is doing in the earth realm right now. I heard this said recently that we're hearing the beginning raindrops of the third great awakening. I really believe that in my heart. I've, I've participated in revival for decades, but what I see happening in the young adults in the United States and on the mission field, it's absolutely amazing and exciting. So I want you to open your heart, open your mind. Let's listen to the word of God. I'm coming preaching and believing that God is good. He is ultimately good and he has good in store for you and he has good intentions for you. So open up your heart, listen to the word today. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of John chapter 20. I'm preaching a series called Witness and uh, didn't this band do a great job? Man alive. Thank God for everybody, our production team, our greeters, our ushers, our cafe, our parking lot guys, our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our seniors ministry, our small groups ministry, missions ministry. Amen. Our, hallelujah. <laughs> I could just keep going on and on. I just I love Fountain of Life Church. Amen. Amen. Look at John chapter 20 with me, and we dealt first of all with Mary Magdalene as being the first eyewitness of the resurrection. And then last week I talked about the two disciples that Jesus encountered on the road to Emmaus as being two who witnessed him after his resurrection. And today I'm going to talk about Thomas, and I think it's an intriguing story, and so we're going to get out of the gate running here. Verse 24, now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Thomas came, the doors being shut. I think that's an indication that Jesus walked right through the door and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here. And put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. This is one of the, the, one of the times that we have where the disciples actually worshipped Jesus. Okay, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. I'm going to preach this morning. I'm going to title this sermon, Jesus is for Skeptics Too. Jesus is for Skeptics Too. You know, we often define someone by one mistake they make. If you look at, just even in the Bible, if we look in the Old Testament, we think about Jacob, we think about him deceiving his brother and stealing his father's blessing or deceiving his father. If we look at David, we think of David and him sinning with Bathsheba. Or if we look at Samson, we look at Samson caving to the temptations of Delilah. Or on and on and on we go. If we look at Peter, we often think about Peter when he denied the Lord three times at the trial and crucifixion. And if we look at Thomas, we think about this. And we call him Doubting Thomas. The Bible doesn't call him that, but he's called Doubting Thomas. And it's even used in our modern, you know, conversations. If someone doesn't believe what we're saying, we'll just say, you're just a doubting Thomas. And he's defined by that, really. And I think there's good reason for that. Because if you look in the Gospels, the several instances where Thomas speaks up, it seems to be all in skepticism. 
If you notice uh, in, the, in the story where Jesus is with his disciples and he receives news that his good friend Lazarus has died, the Bible says Jesus cries, he, Jesus wept. And, you know, that's the one verse everybody says they memorized. <laughs> Jesus wept. And then the disciples, I think, were kind of amazed that he didn't get up and go back to Jerusalem immediately and see about his friend and their family. But there was good reason why he shouldn't go. I mean, if he would have gone, he maybe would have been arrested. There would have been a mob try to get the disciples so they understood it. But then he waited two days, and he tells them, hey, let's go see Lazarus. And the disciples are kind of confused, and so Thomas speaks up, and Thomas speaks, let's go too and die with Jesus. I never noticed this before, but it's really a skeptical answer. It's not like, oh, let's go too. It's let's go too and die with Jesus. John chapter 14, Jesus is telling them that he's going to go prepare a place for them that where he is, they may come also. And he said, where I'm going, you know, and the way I'm going, you know. And then Thomas responds and says, no, we don't, Lord. No, we don't, Lord. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? The, you know, skeptical Thomas here. No, we don't know the way. Let's go to Jerusalem and die too. I won't believe it until I see him face to face, till I'm able to touch the nail prints, till I'm able to touch the side where he was pierced. I won't believe it. Good news is Jesus is for skeptics too. Good news is Jesus is for everybody. He's for young and old and no matter what economic background you come from, no matter what nationality you are, no matter what ethnicity you are, Jesus came to save the world. Come on, somebody. God so loved the world, the cosmos, that he gave his only begotten son. He came for all of us. And if we would have a testimony from each one of you in here today, none of us could testify that we were born perfect. None of us could testify that we were born, born again and saved. All of us had to come the way of the cross. All of us needed a Savior. All of us had to believe. Can you shout amen? amen. So in the few minutes I have this morning, I'm going to give you three reasons why you should believe in Jesus and his resurrection, even if you're a skeptic with us this morning. And I hope there's some out there. I'm going to give you three reasons. I'm going to delve into some apologetics here, so just... Hang on with me. And if you've been serving the Lord for 50 years, this will be encouraging to you too. Number one, we have historical evidence. We have historical evidence that validates the life of Jesus, what happened to him, and his resurrection. We have historical evidence enough. I'm trained as a historian. My PhD work, my bachelor's work was in forms of in different periods of history. And so when I look at this, I get really excited. Because if you look at historical evidence from Julius Caesar or from Napoleon or different people, you know, we have great written records. But in the ancient world, we have as much, if not more, written about Jesus and his life than any other ancient figure. So first of all, we have the historical evidence that he actually lived, died, and rose from the dead. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the four Gospels testify to the fact that he was a real person, lived a real life, died on a cross, and resurrected from the dead. And I love that we have four Gospels because if we just had one Gospel, we wouldn't feel completed. But, you know, I look at it this way. For, some people like to point out, you know, differences in the Gospels. But if you look at it from different points of view, I think it all coalesces and makes sense. It's, it's, it's like... If I were on one side of the street and you were standing on the other side of the street and we saw a car accident, you and I could probably come away with a little different version of what happened. And we would see it from different angles, and that's what we get from the Gospels. But each of the Gospels were written by, number one, an eyewitness of what happened or from the testimony of an eyewitness of what happened. We have the gospel record that tells us Jesus lived, died, and resurrected from the dead. We even have non-Christian records that verify the life of Jesus, such as the Jewish historian Josephus or the Roman historian Tacitus, and then throughout the patristic period, 
scores of documents that testify to the followers of Jesus who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Not only that, we have this history, this rich history of martyrs or people who actually gave their lives for the testimony of Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you give your life for something, you must really believe in it. You must really believe in it. Something happens in the Gospels with Peter. Peter denies the Lord, but then we see Jesus appearing to him. And then by Acts chapter 2, Peter is a completely transformed man. He stands up and preaches to the crowd and then later is arrested and stands before probably the same council that condemns Jesus. And he stands before that council and he is so bold, it's striking in the, in the text. He is so bold, he stands up and tells them, you are the ones who crucified the Lord of glory. What caused that guy to change from a man who was denying he knew him to one who didn't care if they killed him? He could stand there with utter boldness. Something changed. I'll tell you what changed. He saw the resurrected Jesus. He saw the resurrected Jesus, and it caused all of them to go out with fierce boldness, risking their lives for the message they had. And history is littered with the stories of martyrs just like that. Also, we have John's testimony, which I think is particular, and it's, it's interesting. John in the Gospels was probably written later than the other three Gospels, but some people believe that John's Gospel was all metaphor and symbol. I have a friend who lives in western North Carolina, and he pastors a church. And he said he used to go to lunch with some guys who were uh, denominational pastors, and some of them had been educated at a very famous university in North Carolina. And he said they were talking about Easter services one year. And he was they were talking about what they were going to do in their churches. And, and those guys looked at my friend and said, Do you actually believe Jesus rose from the dead? Isn't that really just metaphor and symbol? And, it's, and my friend was, was shocked by that, and he subsequently didn't go back to those lunch meetings. But there are people who believe that. But if you look at John, John not only wrote the Gospel of John, he also wrote the Revelation. And if you look at Revelation, it is filled with metaphor and symbol. And so I think John knew the difference between historic data and prophetic symbols. I think he knew very well the difference between those. And I think John is a powerful witness to the life of Jesus. Plus, John was probably the youngest disciple. And he doesn't speak of himself in first person. He speaks of himself in third person. So if you remember the story, the women saw the tomb was empty. And then the Bible says, Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. Matter of fact, they ran to the tomb. John was writing about himself. And I think he put a little brag in there. He said, because Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb, and the other disciple outran him. <laughs> I believe Peter was the oldest of the disciples, and I believe Peter, John was the youngest, so come on. But nonetheless, we have that record. We have historical evidence of the resurrection itself. Listen to this. The grave was empty. The grave clothes were neatly left behind. The stone enclosing the tomb was rolled away. The body of Jesus was never found. The grave was guarded by Roman soldiers. No one ever claimed to have stolen the body of Jesus. The presence of the grave clothes left behind is significant in itself. Because they were packed with spices, which were very valuable. And if robbers had come to take the clothes away, surely they would have taken the grave clothes as well. But they were laid there, evidence that somebody had walked right out of them. The resurrection. And then Jesus appears after his resurrection. We have 11 different accounts in the Gospels where Jesus appears to people. He appears to the women. He appears to the men. He appears to the disciples. He appears to over 500, Paul said, at one setting. That is an Im impressive testimony that this stuff is real. Amen. Then we have church growth itself. The church in Acts absolutely exploded. It exploded in the early church. It only took a few centuries for those few disciples to multiply and take over the Roman Empire. 
By the year 313 or on later into the death of Constantine, Christianity had basically taken over the Roman Empire. That's a testimony to the fire and zeal of some people who weren't following a tradition or weren't following just fables or some kind of fantasies or some kind of mythology. They were following something that was so real, it propelled them to go to the four corners of the known world and preach the gospel. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. Not only that, we have prophetic scripture, the Old Testament prophesying the Messiah would come. Jesus himself telling his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, I have to go to Jerusalem and I will suffer and be crucified at the hands of the authorities and I will rise again. And not only that, just looking at the Bible from a literary point of view, the Gospels and the story of Jesus and his resurrection stand as a crescendo or an apex of what God was doing from the beginning to end, that God was on a journey to repair the breach between mankind and himself. And he was on this progressive, revelatory journey where he started with one man named Abraham and then one nation named Israel and then to the uttermost parts of the earth through his Messiah who was prophesied through Old Testament writing prophets that one day the perfect Davidic Messiah would come and rule and reign in Jerusalem. Oh, hallelujah. Historical evidence alone has to be considered if you're a skeptic. Second thing is, though, not only do we have the history, we have contemporary witnesses as to the power and efficacy of the Christian message. This room is filled right now with contemporary witnesses. I am one who can testify to the power of the living Jesus. I wasn't raised in church. I came in from the outside. God knocked on my heart's door when I was 16 years old and lying in a hospital bed. Something came and spoke to me one night, and it totally transformed my life. And I've been pursuing this thing ever since then. Like St. Augustine, it's credo ut intelligam. I believe in order that I may understand. I believe and now I've been chasing that understanding for almost 40 years. Hallelujah. God can change your life. Let me read you a few contemporary testimonies. First of all, there was a, there was a Dr. Simon Greenleaf. I ran across his testimony and thought it was powerful. He was the royal professor of law at Harvard. And he wrote one of the standard textbooks for law used in law schools in America called A Treatise on the Law of Evidence. He believed the resurrection of Jesus was a total hoax. So he set out once and for all to prove the myth of the resurrection. And after thoroughly examining the evidence, he decided the exact opposite thing that the resurrection must have been true. And he wrote a book, and this is an old title, and this is how old titles go. He wrote a book entitled An Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists by the Rules of Evidence Administered in the Courts of Justice. (laughs) In which he emphatically stated it was impossible that the apostles could have persisted in affirming the truths they had narrated had not Jesus Christ actually risen from the dead. He concluded that according to the jurisdiction of legal evidence, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the best supported event in all human history. He committed his life to Jesus. There's the story re- more recently of Leah Libresco, who, was a math- who is a mathematician, and in 2012 she was described herself as a geeky atheist but she was a mathematician. She used to host a, uh, a talk show where she would interview you know, Christians and kind of, in a polite way, argue with them. But something always tripped her up, and it's called the moral argument. And the moral argument simply goes like this. There seems to be, in the world, some things that are right and some things that are wrong. When she looked at child abuse... She said to abuse a child is always wrong. And we have a problem here. She was a mathematician. And in the world of mathematics, you have hard rights and wrongs. You have correct answers and incorrect answers. So if we have mathematics and and an issue like child abuse, then there seems to be some absolute truths that I have to deal with. Some things are just morally right or wrong. 
And so the moral truth and the moral argument started working on her. And what happened as a result? She was converted. She believed in Jesus Christ and became a Christian. It caused a real backlash from the atheist community and garnered public attention when she told her story on CNN. And in her interview, she explained that while plenty of questions remained, Christianity explained things she was sure of better than her atheism ever could. As she put it, quote, morality is something we discover like archaeologists, not something we build like architects. And Christianity did, offered an explanation for it that was compelling. And she said, my argument against God was always, there can't be a God because everything in the world seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got the idea of what is just and unjust if there isn't some moral truth? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of what a straight line is. And it brought her to the breaking point of accepting the Lord. One more famous contemporary of ours is C.S. Lewis. Lewis was a British literary critic, a scholar, an author. He took the chair of medieval and Renaissance English at Cambridge. He was an intellectual giant. He wrote works such as the Chronicles of Narnia or his, his radio talks to the, to the nation of, of England during World War II became a book called Mere Christianity. But he was influenced by two men. One was J.R.R. Tolkien of The Lord of the Rings. And the other was G.K. Chesterton, a convert who was a, uh, a journalist who became a convert and Catholic. And he wrote some fascinating works. One on orthodoxy, one on Thomas Aquinas and different things. But anyhow, in 1931, he said these words. Lewis said, I gave in and I admitted that God really was God. I gave in and admitted that God really was God. And he said, perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England was me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is for skeptics too. Yeah. Let me give you one more argument. And this comes from philosophy because I know at 10.52 a.m. you're ready for philosophy. <laughs> There's a 13th century Franciscan uh, philosopher named William of Ockham. And he, he came up with an argument that we call Occam's razor. And it basically goes like, this is a simplified form of it. it and, and it goes like this. The simplest argument is often the truth. The simplest explanation is often the truth. Now think about how this relates to Christianity and our morality. First of all, if we look at the Christian argument, it is the world was created by God. Something went terribly wrong with the world. That's explained in Scripture. And then God came down, in Tim Keller's words, and walked through the bomb site, rubble, and found us. Gave himself for us and repaired that relationship. Let's just take the universe, for example. If you don't believe that, then you have to work long and hard to figure out how the universe got here. And so you say, well, it came through evolutionary process, through random chance of selection. There was, uh, and, and so how do you explain the universe? And so there have been different ones to, to, to offer these expl explanations. Maybe there are multiple universes, and ours is one of those spawned out of the other universes. Or the universe has always been, which was an atheist argument. Or I listened to a lecture some time ago by Richard Dawkins, who was a famous neo-atheist from England. And he offered this, and he's supposedly a brilliant guy, and I'm sure he was. He offered this possibility, and I couldn't believe my ears. Someone asked him, if God doesn't exist, then how did the world come into being? And he said, well, it's possible that humankind was seeded here by aliens. That we were seated here by aliens. And when I heard this, I looked at the TV and I thought, what is he smoking? <laughs> if you don't believe in the simplest truth, it takes complex narratives and arguments to figure stuff out. Yeah. Somebody say historical evidence. <laughs> Contemporary witness. And then the simplest answer. Simplest answer is that the Bible record is true. 
The simplest answer is that Jesus really did live a real human life, suffer on a cross and die for our sins. The simplest answer is he really did rise from the dead. We have scores of evidence and scores of changed lives to, to testify to that fact. The simple answer is we must believe that that's what's required of us. So Jesus looks at Thomas and he says, Thomas, you've believed because you've seen, and that's fantastic, but blessed are those who believe who have never seen. You know who those folks are? That's us in this room right now. We're the ones who believe but have never seen. But we've had an encounter. Can somebody shout amen? amen. And this term belief in itself is powerful. It means to be persuaded of, to have confidence in. It's the conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by certain inner and higher prerogatives of his law, of the law of the soul. He, we are compelled and convinced because we know this is true. And that conviction goes deeper than just the mind. It goes down into the very heart and soul of man. And there it becomes active and living and transforms our lives. So God had a plan that Jesus would come, the only Son of God, would offer himself according to Old Testament precedent as a sacrifice for our sins, would die on a Roman cross by crucifixion, and then would be placed in the grave. But yet he wouldn't remain in the grave. The Bible says that he was three days in the ground. And if you look scripturally, three days is absolutely profound because on the third day of creation was when God created plant form that came from seed and bursted through... The Praise God. Thank you for listening today and thank you for opening up your heart to hear the Word of God. Listen, I want to pray for you quickly before we go off the air here. If you have any needs in your life or if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, I really want to see you make it to heaven. I want to see you finish this race well. Amen. God has provided the greatest gift of all history. That is, He gave us His Son that, who would die for us so that we wouldn't have to face eternity without God. So if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, let's start there today. Then I'm going to pray for healing and other needs in your life. So just pray this with me. Father, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Forgive me of all sin and become the Lord of my life, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Now I'm going to pray for your needs. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those who are struggling in their bodies, struggling in their minds. Lord, I pray that you minister to them right now. I pray that you touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. We bind every demonic influence in their life that's attacking them and we cast it out and we just declare the glory of God and victory of God in their hearts right now in the name of Jesus. Be set free by the power of God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for watching us. Go in victory and give God the praise. It's gonna come. Look straight ahead, my face towards the sun. We will